My name is Jane Cornwell. I'm going to be, uh, well, just sitting here really and listening to these incredible people talking. Um, so this is the Bright Med uh, International Seminar. These are the sages of the med this year, or the, the, the boffins of Bright Med, we might say. Um, I'm going to uh, welcome each speaker and just give you a little uh, precy of what they do, and then they're going to uh, answer just one question. Then we're going to have a dialogue. We're going to have a chat, um, and there'll be opportunity for questions. Um, but first of all, it's my great honour to uh, introduce Jane Murray, um, who's the uh, person responsible, really, for... for these talks, and, and Jane's the founder of PeaceBeam. She's a lawyer and a former venture capitalist who spent 20 years investing in startup and early stage companies, particularly in telecommunication software and mobile networks. She spent a decade teaching fourth wave philosophy and mysticism in London, um, and this is a very unusual combination that has enabled her to bridge the divide uh, between the two worlds of materialism and spirituality, which is what we're going to be talking about a lot today. Um, and those two things are beginning to coalesce at the frontier of, of technology. So Jane's passionate about reconnecting humanity to its unique and ancient human technologies uh, of empathy, compassion, and kindness through the modern technology of digital communication, and believes that we can create these solutions to the existential problems we face as a collective. And um, I think we all agree here that that's uh, quite an urgent um, task. Jane, just tell us a little bit about PeaceBeam and, um, and, and what PeaceBeam does. What's, what's the remit? Sure, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, PeaceBeam arrived as a, a, almost a fully formed idea um, for me in the aftermath of, uh, of the Brexit uh, vote um, in London. I'm, I'm based in London. Um, and I think that... Um, I was, I, was, I was just saying to Paul, actually, before our mics were switched on, that I was, I was so struck by my own naivety in the aftermath of that, that vote, um, where I had believed that the kind of borders that um, exist <clears throat> internally and then, and then are represented externally in our world no longer existed. I didn't believe that people held those incredibly polarized views anymore because I was very siloed in my own way of thinking. And so it was a tremendous shock to me to see the division, um, the isolation, uh, the stress and the kind of overwhelm uh, that is part and parcel of, a, of, of living in a city anyway, but it became so exaggerated um, in the aftermath of that. And so Peace Beam kind of arrived to me um, as an idea of um, how, do we, how do we start to activate people's hearts again so that, so that we can understand our deep interconnectedness. Um, and it seems to me that the, there are certain pre-existing communities that we don't understand, again, because of the siloing and the, you know, the other um, products of our, kind of, uh, our sense of individualism that we have these days. Um, and and the, one of the biggest communities, and one that I was part of, a pre-existing community, is the commuting community in, in London, um, where people are doing exactly the same thing, usually at exactly the same time every day, and usually with the same people, even though you know, nobody obviously in London looks at each other or speaks to each other, because that wouldn't be okay. Um, and so, so it really struck me that if we can start tapping into the pre-existing communities that, that, that exist and, and activating um, people's heart centers, that we, you, know, you might begin to seed the idea of our interconnectedness. And so Peace Beam is a very simple idea. It's we deliver five minute audios um, to very specifically for the commuter. And it's five minutes because we're catering to our very short attention span and, and the sense of uh, overwhelm that people have anyway. And you don't want to give people another you know, big job to do. Um, and so we, you know, we, we, we've done our, uh, our testing of that idea and we're about to build our MVP. So that's, that's where it came from. But it was a direct product, really, of 
uh, the impact of the, uh, of not just Brexit, but then the incredibly destructive election cycle that we witnessed in the, in the US. Um, so that's, that's, what, that's what he's been Great, thanks yeah. so much. Okay, so my next guest um, is Dr. Jean-Marc Rickley, uh, who arrived at 2 a.m. this morning, so I think that's, uh, you know, <laughs> almost deserves a round of applause, but I'm going to get you to do that a bit later on. Um, he's responsible for the GCSP's activities related to global risk and resilience under the umbrella of the Emerging Security Challenges Program. Uh, Jean-Marc was previously an assistant professor at the Department of Defence Studies at King's College in London, uh, the branch based in Doha. Um, so many different things here. I'm just picking out some. He is a senior advisor for the AI uh, initiative at the Future Society uh, at Harvard Kennedy School. He's an expert on lethal autonomous weapon systems for the United Nations and for the United Nations Institute for Disarmament and Research. Uh, his research interests are on the use of force in international relations, small states, foreign and security policy, disruptive technologies and security, risks analysis, and non-traditional security issues such as energy, financial, and cyber security. His geographical areas of expertise are Europe, the United States, the Middle East, and the Gulf. So Jean-Marc, for the purposes of being here, here in Gibraltar, please tell us about your role in the GCSP. What is it, and, and what do you do? Right, so the GCSP is an international foundation that was set up when Switzerland joined NATO Partnership for Peace, which is uh, a, an initiative that uh, brings together uh, states that are members of NATO as well as non-members, but it's a token, token forum. And uh, the Swiss government set up a free research center, and the Geneva Center for Security Policy has the mission of educating uh, senior officials uh, to security policy issues. My role in, in the center is I'm in charge of global risk, which is a lot uh, these days, but uh, I have three hats. My first hat is uh, my traditional area of expertise, which is warfare and transformation of war, as well as Middle East uh, security. My second hat is uh, to uh, try to infuse uh, geopolitical ana analysis and r political risk analysis in the private sector, so using with uh, different sector of industry, banking, trading, and uh, trying to break uh, the, the mold of uh, uh, analyzing risk only through um, quantitative perspective, but also looking at qualitative analysis in terms of scenario planning, but where a specific country or region e is going. And my third hat, which is uh, what is taking now much of my time, is uh, looking at security implication of emerging technologies. I'm particularly uh, focused on uh, artificial intelligence, but also now moving into uh, other areas such as synthetic biology biology and, uh, and neuroscience. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, now we have uh, Paul Ingram uh, over here on, on the far left. And Paul is the executive director of the British American Security Information Council, BASIC is the acronym, a think tank focusing on nuclear disarmament based in London and Washington. Uh, Paul's an expert on the global nuclear disarmament debate uh, and transatlantic security, specifically on issues relating to the UK nuclear weapons system, UK-US transatlantic security, NATO's nuclear posture, Iran's nuclear program, nuclear prolifera pro proliferation politics in the Middle East, and US-Russia bilateral arms reduction treaties. He's also been a politician for the Green Party. Uh, he's had a talk show in Iran, and he's been arrested, I understand, a few <laughs> times. Um, Paul, tell us a little bit, uh, again, for the purposes of today, about your role in BASIC. Mm. Well, of course, BASIC is a, an arm of the CIA, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and we operate uh, to try to bring people together. Uh, understanding, well, when I first started, my focus was very much upon nuclear weapons and the weapons themselves, but I've increasingly come to see nuclear weapons as a symptom of a deeper challenge, which is how to bring people together and to understand their different perspectives. Now, people in the peace movement understand that when it's about other people, but they don't understand it when it comes to themselves, because people know the answer. We all know that we're right, right? So uh, we should get rid of nuclear weapons. But actually, the truth of it is, these are complex, wicked problems where there are no solutions, no easy solutions. 
and that it pays to understand people's perspectives who believe things very differently from yourself. Let me give you an example. I was last week giving a talk to uh, a whole bunch of submariners in Portsmouth. And uh, I was talking there about the future of Britain's nuclear weapons uh, posture. And uh, what, what I was trying to do was to argue that the peace movement and the, uh, the pro-deterrence lobby within Britain have not been serving the people of Britain and the wider community very well because we sit in silos. And if we can actually understand that the objectives in the end are the same, to build security, to understand that we need to move beyond the traps that we're in, uh, wherever we are within the system, then we can actually move together and work together. And, uh, and, and the reception was very positive. I think people are looking to try to climb out of the traps. We can't do it ourselves. We have to give ladders to Putin for him to climb out. He can't do it on, on, on his own. We can't climb out of our trap that we're in without assistance from the Russians. And the same goes domestically within these debates. So my, my mission in BASIC is officially to try to, uh, to bring people together to overcome the barriers to nuclear disarmament. But the truth of it is that my mission is to get people to listen to each other. And that starts with me. Brilliant. Wow. <coughs> OK, thank you so much. Now, here on my left, very honoured to present Alfred Tolle. Now, Alfred uh, is the founder and chairman of Wisdom Together, which is a non-profit association uh, well, founded to foster compassion and wisdom by promoting well-being and values for a prosperous and sustainable world for everyone. Uh, previously, he joined Google's uh, EMEA HQ in Dublin. He was known as the Google Compassion Guy um, in 2011, consulting international companies on their online marketing and digital strategies. He's been the CEO of Lycos in Boston, uh, Vice President of Bertelsmann Online in Asia, Japan, so many things. His experience as an executive manager in these blue chip companies and others uh, ha have led to his belief that we are living in an interconnected society, uh, and that motivates his desire to bring about positive global change. Um, Alfred, you've, you've instigated a number of projects, um, including technology-based projects. Maybe just tell us a little br bit briefly about those and, and, and you know, your role here today, what you're going to be talking about. Thank you so much, Rain. Um, well, in my professional and private career, <laughs> if I might call it career, I've experienced that addressing certain things, like peace or addressing compassion or addressing these, these things is more or less strengthening, you know, the opponent. So, which means, what I found is, let's go deeper, where is decision really happening? Where, where are people from, which point of view are people really making decisions? And can we really have an impact in our societies? So, I'll give you an example. If I'm talking to you about, don't think about the blue elephant, what do you think about? Blue elephant. <laughs> a blue elephant. <laughs> so, which means, if I'm saying we don't need nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. what are we doing? Mm -hmm. We're thinking about nuclear weapons, we are fearing that, the, that there might be some threats against us, and we are producing nuclear weapons. Yeah. This is the kind of thinking which happened throughout the last 300 years. Before that, we were more or less aware about our interdependency and connectedness. So then we started to think about mechanical thinking. So we, we chopped our societies and our companies, which were built based on, on that thinking, in bits and pieces, and trying to define what people need to do in this particular box. And I think that's what I found really sympathetic, what Einstein then, uh, once said. And uh, he said, you know, you have to we, we can't actually solve the problems which we are facing, which is the same kind of thinking which has brought this problem to, to that point. So, which means we need really to rethink the whole thing. And that is why I quit Google at a certain point of time. Maybe we come to, that, uh, to, to, the, to the reasons of that a little bit later. Uh, and I found it wisdom together because I found throughout you know, my travels around the world, so many initiatives of young people, of executives, of scientists, of artists, uh, of spiritual leaders of this world who came together and said, we 
don't, you know, we cannot continue the way we are thinking right now. We have to come together. We have to just emerge without presenting a solution. We have to present questions and maybe be open for a new way of how we can construct something completely new. And that is what Wisdom Together is about. So we bringing people together from that field, scientists, artists, executives, spiritual leaders, and um, cross generations. And we are discussing um, concepts, but not only ideas and concepts. We, are, we want to show what is concretely happening. So where has this concept really been materialized and realized in this real world? And uh, so we did a conference in Dublin, one in Stockholm, in Costa Rica, in Munich, in Oslo, and uh, we brought people together on this and we're initiating dialogues and conversations. We are intensifying that and going deeper um, by doing retreats, consultancy and coaching of uh, companies, organizations and individuals. We are addressing leaders, but leaders can be found in every um, level of our society. Mm -hmm. That are people who could be role models, it could be teachers, it could be people who, who are leading teams. And these people come together with an openness, curiosity, and with the understanding that we are the creator of the world. We are not reacting to something which is happening us, uh, to us from outside. We are creating this field which are creating the world which we want to live in. And that is what we try to initiate with Wisdom Together. Brilliant. Well, here we are this year's Sages of the Med. Um, what I want to try and do now is just get everybody to, to have, a, have a dialogue. Let's just sort of have a chat. And um, we'll start off, I think, with, with this year's theme, which is borders. And let's start with, with Jane. And, and you know, what, what do borders mean to you in terms of this talk and, uh, and peace beam? Well, I think, um, I mean, there's obviously, you know, given that we're in Gibraltar, we have the, we have the very obvious um, border issues that have been, you know, part of, part of the history of the jurisdiction and, and continue to, you know, you have a hard border, not very far from here. Um, but I guess I, I you know, I, I see borders in terms of, my belief is that everything that is externalized is, is, is created from our internal view of the world, from, from, it's a projection of our collective inner world. Um, and I think that as we move forward into the technological age at a, at a speed that I think none of us are really prepared for or, or, or aware of the, the, the kind of quantum development of um, technology and artificial intelligence and those kinds of things. My concern is that if we do not understand our own internal borders, that the status quo is going to be automated in a way that we then can't move out from. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and so um, that's practice or um, understanding of how we connect deeply into ourselves and therefore to each other, because our internal landscapes are not as different as we imagine that they are, um, I think is, uh, is vital um, as we move forward, because the, because the kind of borders that we are used to, you know, the national borders and the traditional borders are being eroded or, or, or um, you know, are now sort of almost irrelevant in, 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 with the spread of technology. Um, so that's why, that's where I am very concerned that we, mm -hmm. that we, that it's the reconnection of ourselves to, to our, our own internal worlds, worlds and therefore to each other in, mm -hmm. in the context of borders. So, mm. Be, for me, beyond the technology, I'm looking deeper at the way we set our societies up and the politics and how we organize. So speaking as a Brit, uh, you know, the, the way in which the House of Commons is, uh, is, is set up, so it's us and them, mm -hmm. uh, goes back to a time when Parliament was set up in a church. And so the structure of the church creates the way in which we do politics, which is such a topsy-turvy way of thinking about it, but it it's actually explains a lot of the political culture mm -hmm. within Britain. Uh, and that's reflected very strongly within the sorts of debates that I'm involved in around nuclear weapons. So my, my method, if you like, is to blow up the church and to actually get people to sit round in a circle and to understand that we're, we're all in this with the same objective, which is to build safety and security, to have a country that is not causing the problem but is part of the solution. And that means taking away the borders. 
Now, when I was trying, when, when I was first invited to be a talk show host on state Iranian television, my perspective there was uh, I was going to uh, speak to the people of Iran and to give them an understanding of what it's like from a British perspective. And I very quickly uh, came to understand that the people of Iran know British politics probably better than most people in Britain uh, because they had to think uh, and see what the mindset was of the people that were threatening to, to actually do some military action on them. And, and, the, and the experience I had on Iranian television was that this was, a, this, this was part of the way of shaking the perspectives, not just of the viewers that I was talking to, but of myself. And that really came back to me to understand, actually, you think you've got the answers, but you haven't. And if you, if you engage from a position of, do you know, I think I've got some clarity, but I could be wrong. I think we need to engage together in a project to try to get rid of nuclear weapons, but I could be wrong. The person who you're trying to communicate with can pick that up organically. There's a sort of sense in which there is, there, is a, there is a purpose to this conversation because this person in front of me is more open than people that, than I, that, that I've talked to about this before. I can engage with this person. This, this, this conversation could, could go somewhere. And that's crucial, I think, particularly in the nuclear weapons debate, but in, in fact to any debate that we're involved in. So, Mark, <coughs> yeah. uh, we're living an interesting time because on the one hand you have access to technology and you can interact pretty much with everybody on Earth uh, instantly. And so we managed to remove border. At the same time, what we're witnessing is a return to the concept of, of border. There, have, there has never been so many walls that have been erected between country as as now. Um, and so you have, on the one hand, this movement towards globalization. The other hand, you have a, a backlash where people are uh, felt threatened by this, this openness and they return to you know, uh, notions of nationalism for, for states, especially in Europe. Uh, in the Middle East, it's uh, Iran religion, where you have a, uh, the rise of uh, popular, popular movements in Europe that translate in the Middle East into a sectarian uh, uh, identity. So uh, at the same time you are being exposed to anything that is going on in the world, at the same time, you have to find your roots. And these create major li uh, lines of conflicts uh, that we're witnessing in Europe, in, uh, in the United States, in Northern America, in, uh, in the Middle East, in, in, in Asia. And, and this, is in, uh, this phenomenon is magnified by technology. And um, it's interesting that the concept of border or frontier, we call frontier technology, you know, this emerging tech, because we are moving into an area where these technologies are, are bringing something new. And uh, for the first time, we are interacting or we are creating technologies that will interact with what is it to be a human being. And so here we are moving into a new era where um, things that were related to science fiction now mm -hmm. uh, c can become reality. Uh, we, we might talk about, for instance, uh, brain-computer interaction, pairing your, your brain with the machine. Experiments are increasingly being done in the field. And so what we're doing, we are creating enhanced human being, and uh, for the first phase, Maybe in the future uh, we will reach a point where you know machine will take over. That might not be uh, tomorrow, but from a scientific point of view, we are increasingly moving into into this world. So we have this, if you want, hardcore geopolitics mm -hmm. that has been transformed by technology. At the same time, we are uh, uh, going back to some of the old. Uh, the old uh, rational that we, we, we witnessed in the 19th century, but the push of technology is, uh, is pushing the way we relate to each other in a very different way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so Alfred, uh, obviously 
what you do is very timely, given what's going on, but what do borders mean to you in terms of, of your outlook philosophy? So what I, what I have experienced is that, um, that borders are starting with ourselves, inside of ourselves. And everything is starting with ourselves. So what I'm witnessing, the, just what John Mark was uh, referring to, is that more and more people I'm talking to in the politic world, in the business world, they are observing things and they feel themselves as victims who uh, has mm -hmm. to react to something which happens to them. At the moment when, um, when I come together with people who are saying, we are creating what we need in this world, in every moment we can change everything in this world. At that moment of time, you know, everything seems to be possible. Mm -hmm. And that is, interestingly, you know, the successful companies today, you know, the people who created that had this notion. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, well, regardless what the people say, you know, we can do it. We can make it happen. So, which means everything what we see here, whether, whether every material thing, whether this is this table here, what we see was once an idea, was once an idea from somebody. And this idea was somebody invited other people to create this table, and here is the table. So, it starts with our kind of idea, with our consciousness, with our mind, that is creating everything we want. So. That's why we can start on this level of who is right, who is wrong. Um, is Putin right? That was the recent discussion. Isn't he wrong? We were in Lithuania uh, last week and in Norway and last year I was in Russia and I spoke to a lot of Russian people about this. They have a totally different understanding um, and mindset of the world than I experience with people in America or in Europe where I've been. And it's not, you know, um, you know it's not like you are guilty, or I will blame you, or I will blame you. It's more about that they have this worldview. Mm. So I wouldn't say I'm right or they are wrong. I would say, okay, this is the way it is, and that are the borders we are talking about. Mm. The world is not as it is. The world is as we see it. And as we see it means we have to change the way and create opportunities for people to develop and see the world on a broader perspective. As soon as this is happening, we see that there is a tremendous, actually, new kind of ideas which are coming. And I worked for Google, I'll give you an example in Google X, for instance, which is, an, which is um, this kind of, you know, a creative area of Google. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the, the sky is the limit. People are thinking about everything is possible and they do it. The, what I'm, um, what I'm discussing, uh, what I was discussing with people in Google is that you're using it in a very mechanistic kind of thinking. If you broaden this up, and it's not result-oriented, so we need to have a product coming out of this, but we need to have a different understanding how we're going to work together and what we want to do together, then a lot of new things might emerge. And, uh, and this is on a, on a deeper level, systemic level, understanding that everything we do here, so when we are sitting together here, you know, this has an effect on others. So we are creating this web. You know this butterfly theory, probably. Mm. You know, the butterfly mm -hmm. is flying out. He's creating, you know, a certain energy in the world which can create a typhoon on the other side of the world. And if our um, executives, politicians, would understand this on a deeper level, on a deeper level of humanity, then the decision would be different. And then we can cope with all these kind of technologies. But there are, of course, you know, um, certain groups who want us not to understand that everything is possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, they influence us in a certain way. And that's why you probably have experienced that in your own life. When you're looking back 20 years ago or so, you saw certain things totally different than you see it today. And that not only because you have the information, but because you are on your personal development a step further ahead. You see that from a different angle. And imagine what is, what is the potential in all of us, in all of you, if we could understand this and focus more on this humanity. And that means overcome that borders. Thank you. So, Jane, let's go back to you. I mean, you, you've, uh, you've taught your, uh, the fourth way principle, you've, you know, you've, um, and, and mysticism. Do you feel that there's a... 
if, if, if the individual can overcome kind of the barriers within themselves, they can get to a point that Alfred's talking about. Do you have a sense that there's a kind of hunger for change uh, at the moment because we're kind of in this fast growth? I, yeah, I, 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 down, do, I do have rather. a sense that there is. And I, and I do also think that there has been a, you know, a fairly seismic shift in consciousness generally, I think, over the last maybe 20 or 30 years. I think the difficulty that we are facing now is um, the well-being industry, for example, and that, 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 that covers everything from kind of, you know, yoga retreats to transhumanism, ultimately, and biohacking, right? So that, that kind of well-being industry is now huge. It's valued at about $342 billion um, last year, and it's growing. Yeah, that's a lot. And the difficulty, I think, with the... Some of, the, some of the shift in consciousness has actually created a, uh, an exaggerated sense of individualism and self. So it's about my well-being, it's mm. about my place in the world, about my consciousness, mm. my enlightenment. And that's uh, supported and fed by some of these technologies that are you know, emerging. So you know, Jean-Marc and I were speaking this morning and, and, and he was talking about the kind of supranational um, elements of these kinds of technologies where, you know, you are talking about transhumanism and that kind of thing. And the more granular kind of commercial level of that is what's called transformative technology, um, which is marketed as being a really good thing to everybody because you will be more productive at work and you will be, and if you, you know, if you, uh, we could maybe control your proclivity towards depression and those kind of things. And they're marketed as really attractive to people, but again, it's all about me. You know, there's a, there's a kind of a narcissism that goes with it, which I think is um, extremely destructive. And so for me, I think it's the, it, w what we need to do is to capture that kind of emerging wave of a shift in consciousness and redirect it from, from well-being to world-being is what I, I see okay. it as, is that, mm -hmm. you know, that absolutely we all want to, you know, to, to emerge into a consciousness that is, uh, that I, I think is a very strong aim for a lot of people. Not everybody now, I mean, you know, but it, it is a strong aim for a lot of people. But that has to be meaningful to the collective because, you know, and again, having, having spent, you know, quite a lot of time in, in, in different traditions and modalities, uh, you know, if, if we can all sit in a room and reach a higher state and be enlightened, but the world around us is collapsing, then so what? So what, <laughs> really? So I think it's, it, it's bringing it back to a sense of, yeah, a sense of our world being, a sense of our collective okay. place in the world. Yeah. Okay, what would be yeah. great is if, you, if you, any of you guys yeah. just want to yeah. jump in, absolutely yeah. just jump in, but let's yeah. just say, I want to get John Mark's take because you know, you were, you're very much the, the, the science um, and <laughs> you were saying that spirituality is not something that perhaps um, you've, you've addressed that much, you said. You were saying earlier, but you know, do, do you want to? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what he said. Uh, <laughs> do you want to just come yeah, back to yeah. talk about that? Global risk uh, occupies a lot of my time, so I don't have much time to to deal with spirituality. And uh, but it's yeah. interesting. Let's just talk about um, that. But what is important in, in, in what you mentioned is um, when you talk about technology, every technology has a social history, and you have to understand how this technology emerged and its response to social history. If you think about the Nobel Prize, for instance, what is Nobel famous for, having invented? Dynamite, okay? <laughs> Nobel Peace Prize dynamite, you know? There is some kind of a mismatch, but if you think about that, you know, Nobel's idea was that, you know, inviting dynamite would have such a ter terrible effect on warfare, then warfare will be eliminated. The same pretty much story with the machine gun. When the machine gun was invented back in the 19th century during the US Civil War, uh, Gatling, who invented uh, the machine gun, um, he did it for two reasons. One, because there were not enough uh, people, um, uh, migrants from uh, Ireland to actually to, to fight um, in, in the US. And also because he thought that this, uh, this weapon would make the job of several soldiers and we will need less soldiers in the battlefield, therefore there will be less casualties. It turns out completely the opposite way because the machine gun uh, uh, gave a tremendous uh, power to uh, defender and, uh, and led to massive casualties. So my point here is that 
Every technology has a social history. Now, when we think about current technologies, you have to uh, deconstruct why are we actually uh, developing the technology that we're inventing now. As you rightly mentioned, uh, for instance, you know, we talk about artificial intelligence and, uh, and others. Uh, the push for developing this technology is the private sector, the commercial sector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. all about productivity, yeah. uh, 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 as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 the goals, the, the model, the business model that are being developed are all about, uh, about this thing. Now, uh, it's good to be hyper-productive, but at one point, you know, you were mentioning before that um, uh, you take this, uh, this table and someone had to think about that. Mm -hmm. Well, what we have seen over the last uh, 60, 70 years with the advent of computers, we actually step back from thinking. There is a really good book called um, The Problem with Physics, and it is written by a, a, an American uh, pr professor in theoretical physics. And his point is, I mean, it's a really good book for several reasons. The first one is that if you have no clue about physics, you just read the introduction in 50 pages, 15 pages, you understand the entire history of development of physics. It's very well written. His point is that physics hasn't done any uh, breakthrough over the last 60 or 70 years because of two reasons. The first one is uh, sociological. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to do with the academic system. Right now in physics, if you want to uh, work on issues that matter, you have to work on string theories. And maybe there are 20 chairs in the US on uh, theoretical physics. 18 or 16 chairs are dealing with uh, theoretical uh, quantum, uh, sorry, string theories. If you are a young PhD who aims at becoming professor, which type of research will you look into? you will look into string theories because you have a chance, 16 chance out of 20 to secure position uh, in the future. So there is a sociological argument. The second has to do with the advent of computers and the so-called behavioralist uh, turn in the 50s where instead of thinking, you crunch data and you hope that out of uh, crunching data, you'll find correlation and that will give you an answer. If you look back at the 19th century and before, you had people like uh, Newton or Einstein that thought about crazy ideas, developed theories, and now we are, you know, in CERN Geneva, for instance, we are still trying to prove uh, some uh, concept of uh, theory of Einstein. And so here you had a completely different process called the deductive inductive approach. And right now, we are actually stuck into this mindset of we need data. If you go to companies all about KPIs, trying yeah. to measure the, the productivity of people by purely quantitative terms. Mm -hmm. And that has also entered the academic um, world. Right now, if you want to be promoted in, at university, you, have, you will only be judged on your uh, productivity in terms of impact factor in academic review of books, mm -hmm. but you, have ne you ne will never be promoted for being a good teacher, mm -hmm. which well, is okay. a contradiction yeah. in terms. Perfect. You know? yeah. you're, you're gonna jump in there. Yeah, I think, um, hmm. for me, this is true and not true. In a way, it's true if you're downloading, and that is what algorithms are doing, and um, if you're doing research, and our reductive science is currently working. You're looking at what is, what is happening. You're trying to find um, a support based on uh, your data, um, on your theory. And, um, and if you're thinking along those ways, you are downloading what you already know, what has already happened, and projecting that in the future. How can you developing base, be based on that? How can something really new emerge out of this? And, um, and that is um, based on our utilitaristic thinking. You know, we are thinking everything needs to have a certain justification in terms of KPIs, in terms of measurements, in terms of results, what needs to come out of it. And if we reduce ourselves, our human beings and our society on this kind of thinking, we're going to end up in having to compete with a computer who in this particular area will be always better than us. Mm. But, you know, th our potential is that we are creators. Mm. So, which means, and 
as a German, um, I've experienced in 1989, actually, uh, that the two um, sides of Germany, the reunification, are coming, came together. If you would have asked me in February 1989, or even in March, and most of the people in Germany, or I think all of them, if you would have asked them, would there be a chance that the two Germans will come together again? We all would have said, never, ever. And if, probably after a war, and hopefully that won't happen. So that was the, and what we did is, we downloaded our information and our, you know, perception, what we had in the future, and projected that uh, in the past, and projected that in the future. What happened six months later, or even less than that, that was proven as wrong. You know, something happened. And, and this is happening throughout our history. So if we're looking into this, and I think Heisenberg did that in 1937 or so, when he said the intention of what you're doing is actually have an influence on the photons, and on the, which means on the reality, yeah. which we're still trying to prove, so it's not 100% proven or not, but there is an indication that we can influence things through our intention. So how do we understand our intention? How do we understand from which point internally we are operating and we are making decisions, which means have an effect on others, have an effect on our personal life, on our societies, um, on our nations, on our world. And if we go deeper into this and put our focus in this with an open mind, then I think it will be possible to create something new. And just to finish that up, give you an example, I was working with a club of Madrid um, on the effect um, of uh, marginal societies and how we can um, you know, give them access um, to more decision-making process in mm -hmm. our societies and what kind of effect would that have to sustainability and peace and all this mm -hmm. kind of thing. So I was sitting there in New York and uh, it was like the United Nations, you know, we were sitting with uh, people from the United Nations, from UNEP, from OECD, from World Bank, from a lot of NGOs. We were sitting together and everybody made a statement who he is, how important he or she was, and uh, what kind of agenda he brings to the table. And that brought us nowhere. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I said to the person there, I said, look, you know, if we cannot break this system, we are ending up in writing something mm. which already people know. So we need to come to a new process and how to do this. Mm -hmm. So I did with them um, um, a kind of exercise called um, listening exercise, mm -hmm. just to, to learn how to listen to somebody. And then, you know, the former president of Bosnia and Herzegovina, he was leading that, and he said to me, Zlatko, he said, Alfred, do you really think you can do that with these people? I said, yeah, give it a try. You know, so we did it. And um, it really had a tremendous effect on the, on the outcome. After that, and it was a one-hour kind of thing what we did. After that, we, we listened to each other, we thought about what the other meant, and then we created something which, from my perspective, was meaningful on that level for what we came together. Mm. So, yeah. I, I'd like to build on that because <clears throat> I had the extraordinarily lucky opportunity to be put in a situation where, for six years, I was teaching very senior British civil servants what we call systems thinking as part of leadership development. Uh, these were like pretty near the top of the civil servant civil service. This was their rite of passage to uh, to running uh, departments. And uh, one of the tools we used was active listening. Uh, yeah. And the idea being that if you want to have impact, uh, it doesn't matter where you are within the system, if you're at the top or the bottom or anywhere. If you want to have impact when there is a, 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 a wicked, uh, difficult system where people are in competition and conflict around not just how you do it, but why you're doing it and what you're trying to achieve, the best way of influencing somebody is to be quiet and to, and to ask questions. So you're asking questions, you're interrogating that person's uh, worldview. And then you don't then just come back and say, well, I disagree. You come back and you say, well, what I've understood you say is this, this, and this. Have I got it right? So they're now the experts. They are the one, they are feeling heard. And I can tell you, as a politician who is leading a council, 
even when you're right at the top of an organization, you think that nobody listens to you. And it's not a nice feeling. We all want to be heard, right? Mm. So if you're being heard, you're then opening up to the other. You're, the trust is building, you're opening up, you then start listening because you've been heard. And if we can listen to each other and hear each other, then things start to move. And if we come back to the examples around uh, scientific revolutions, you know, the, the, the way in which scientists who believe in string theory and the way in which scientists who believe in uh, Einsteinian uh, uh, world, uh, world view, they just they speak past one another because they are approaching this with a completely different frame and a different paradigm. In my field, the, 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 the uh, anti-nuclear movement has its narrative that is incredibly uh, coherent internally, but it doesn't have any impact because the other side, the de nuclear deterrence perspective, is also incredibly coherent. It makes sense. You know, if, if you want peace and security, you need to ensure that people over there who have a different uh, 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 set of objectives do not threaten you with annihilation. So you have to threaten them with annihilation. Mm. It, it sort of creates a, a system of stability. Now, of course, well, we introduce new technologies. I mean, we're, we're looking at the way in which uh, the system based upon a secure second strike capability, that is, submarines in the ocean that are un un undetectable, it's the perfect uh, tool for uh, stability around nuclear deterrence because it doesn't matter if your opponent fires 10,000 nuclear weapons at you, if they can't get your submarine, you can respond and deterrence is stable. Well, if you are able to detect submarines, and of course technology is starting to move in that direction, you've got incredibly uh, developed sensing technologies that are, that are, that are um, combining with robotics and artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, uh, and, and increasing capabilities of, of uh, destroying submarines, the whole system becomes unstable. So, so you've got this interaction of technology, perspectives, uh, 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 deep paradigms, and what we have to do in these sorts of situations is to let go a little of the, of the attachment that we have to our perspective, understanding that this is a very complex set of systems in which there are no solutions and no answers. Mm -hmm. This is not about solutions. Complexity is characterized always by a number of different solutions and arguments that don't marry. So if you come in with another solution, you're just contributing to the problem. You have to come to this with questions and with openness and with an understanding that you don't have the solutions. And then we can work together. Great, thanks, Paul. Jane, do you want to <coughs> jump in there? Well, I'm just, I suppose what I'm wondering, having, having listened to that exchange, is why, why are we so uh, seduced by the idea of... Um, that we don't need to think, that we don't, mm. that, 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 that there is a single answer, that there is a silver bullet solution. Um, you know, that kind of idea of the messianic promise, you know, that something will arrive. And we're treating technology like that now, like mm. it's the silver bullet to, you know, to all of our problems. And why we, why we are so seduced by that? What is it in us that, that... Because we don't have the answers. And being in a situation where you're in a place of not knowing is very uncomfortable yeah. for all of us. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes with an answer, it doesn't, if it's a religious answer, scientific or whatever, uh, and, and it makes sense coherently mm -hmm. internally, then we can relax a little because we feel that there is an answer to this incredibly difficult thing. But if we can come to be more comfortable in a place of not knowing, and if we can encourage people to feel that there aren't necessarily answers, but there are perspectives, and that a process which brings these different perspectives together uh, can strengthen and bring us uh, a positive, cons more constructive outcomes, that's a more mature approach. Can I jump <coughs> in for just a second? It's, um, I think it's not the uncomfortability to having no answers. It's about our separation from ourself. If we trust mm. ourself and what will happen in the future, you know, we can be comfortable in not having an answer. It could actually trigger a curiosity, which, uh, which makes you moving and engaging and researching and trying to find. And 
uh, leaving something out. So it's more about that we created a society with separation, and here we come to our theme with borders, where some people feel, okay, if I'm not you know, compliant with this kind of solution or setting or system, then I be left out, and what will happen to me? And that fear and insecurity is the trigger of all which then come out of it. So if people are staying in this, in this system of fear, you know, people can be manipulated very well. And again, an example from Google is saying, you know, I can, you know, the moment of truth, what they once said in a sales conference, is the moment when I can manipulate people at a time when they're unconsciously Mm. Not knowing that they will buy something, but we know that they will in the future, and we, at that moment of state, can influence them in the direction of our clients. And I said, I, we had a long discussion about, is, is that, first of all, it's not my definition of truth. Secondly, it's a, it's a highly manipulative kind of thing. And that makes people insecure. If they are manipulated on that level, they are no longer connected to themselves. And we see that. Everybody has the smartphones. And a lot of us gave actually a lot of our own kind of potential to the smartphones already. Yeah. But, you know, I think we need to understand that we have to come back to our consciousness. We need to come back to, hey, what is our potential by ourselves? We don't need to give our brain and our mind, our heart, our soul to the cloud and leave it to somebody, some companies like Google and Apple and these folks to manipulate that and bring it in a certain direction. Then we have a big problem. But as long as we don't do this, and I think it starts with education. Mm -hmm. There is an initiative in UK, I mentioned it to you, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, Mark Williams from Oxford University has initiated that. And there are a lot of different kind of single, uh, you know, initiatives. What, um, what's his, what's which, this? What's his initiative? Martin? So there is uh, John Kabat-Zinn once developed in the 70s in Boston, Massachusetts, um, a kind of meditation technique. He's a doctor, um, and he brought meditation into um, into uh, medicine, school medicine, and uh, was tremendous success. And he developed a mythology called meditation-based stress reduction. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark Williams, Professor Mark Williams from Oxford University, is retired right now. He was focusing on depression because we see depression rate in our mm. so-called developed societies right. increasing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, so he was he developed based on that MBSR meditation-based stress reduction mythology, um, meditation-based cognitive therapy. Mm -hmm. And this um, went, you know, um, he used that in his work with uh, depressive people, and that has a tremendously success as well in the healing process without mm -hmm. pharmaceutical uh, kind of interventions. So which means that went through the, through the lower house um, and the um, parts of that will be parts of the new curriculum which will be embedded in, in schools. And uh, so that, that is what, what mm -hmm. they do in the UK. Um, but you have it all over the world. There are a lot, there is in Bhutan, there are initiatives in Costa Rica, in Scotland. In, in a lot of these small countries, in New Zealand, there is an, there's an interesting development focusing on, on really completely new way of thinking, of policy making, of integrating, not knowing, but questioning into our policy decisions. Mm -hmm. So um, how to organize structures, how to measure success. It's not on material wealth, it's on mm -hmm. well-being <laughs> of everybody, but well-being newly defined. Um, and that is, that is something which I think is wonderful in this world. Mm -hmm. So when Donald Trump was elected in America, I sent him a thank you letter. Yes, and uh, <laughs> because I said, I thank you that you give us the opportunity yeah. to see where our system is broken and bring all the people together who up to now didn't see the necessity to come up and do something. And now we're seeing a big movement all over back the world. To you, Alfred? And that's wonderful. He never came back <laughs> he to never me. Wrote back, Alfred. Yeah, but I. I <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, you know, and there's the, the flip side of this is that a lot of companies seem to be introducing things like mindfulness, and you know, because you get the increased productivity. It's right. not all about altruism, you know. Yeah. And you're talking about the commercial sector before, Jean Marc. Do you want to say anything about what's just been muted mm -hmm. here? Yeah. Um, 
I had something in mind, I just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's the 2 a.m. arrival. No. Yeah. Um, and just well, you're talking about the commercial sector and, you know, I mean, how do... Uh, no, oh, yeah, well, no. um, when I was listening to, to the discussion, um, we live in a paradoxical world, in a way. We've never had, in the history of humanity, so much access to information. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you can basically do a PhD from your room. You can have free access to any top university courses. So if you want to be trained in mm -hmm. string theories, you can download a podcast, you can watch videos, anything. You go to the website of the Collège de France, for instance, they have all the courses online for free. The paradox is that people are not using that. If you look at videos that are being watched the most on YouTube or any uh, social platform. These are not lectures on <laughs> physics, these are cat's videos, okay? And so here we reach a point where um, you start to question about uh, wh why is it, you know? I think it's laziness. It's laziness on yeah. behalf of ourselves because we live in a society where uh, we want to have access to anything uh, at instantaneously. But this is also because of technology. Because technology, as you mentioned, is dr driving, is uh, making us think in a specific way. It brings us into silos, and it's very difficult to get out of silos. I mean, we're talking about Cambridge Analytica scandal. It's a perfect manipulation. Because basically, um, people answer this online quiz, that gives a lot of information. I mean, you, you, you probably all have customer cards, uh, Sainsbury uh, <laughs> and others, okay? In the, in the old times, um, when you sign up for this card, uh, you would have to answer five to seven questions. With these five or seven questions, um, they are data mining your personality. Now think about the information that you're giving on a daily basis on social media and websites, okay? The CEO of uh, Facebook, uh, Cambridge Analytica, sorry, um, saying that, you know, with 25 likes on Facebook, Facebook know more about you than your uh, colleagues at work. With 50 likes more, uh, about, uh, more than your, your friends, and with 150 more than your, your, your parents. Think about how, much, how many likes you, you, you give on a daily basis or weekly basis, and all the research you to do, each time you do a, re a search on Google, you do two things. First, you give Google more money because you're providing uh, more information about yourself that uh, can be uh, monetized. Second, you improve the algorithm of Google. You might probably have had this experience where you want to log uh, to a certain website and suddenly uh, you have pictures emerging and ask you, okay, uh, could you identify cars? And so you press one, two, three, and these are the cars. What you do, basically, you're helping Google to improve its algorithm because what you do, it's called supervised learning. You're telling the algorithm what is a car and what is not. Okay? So the point I'm, I'm making here is that uh, people increasingly give data about themselves and they expect in return to have an immediate uh, satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, when you teach at university and you're assigned uh, students to read a book, it's becoming difficult. Why? Because this new generation has to be constantly stimulated. So the exercise I, I, I used to do was, you know, to assign to read one or two books in two days. And in two days, I wanted uh, the, the, the students to uh, summarize the book in about 150 words. And it's staggering, the inability nowadays of people, you know, when you read a book, it's about you know, 10, 15, 20 hours you have to, to get into it, and you have to be able to synthesize the information. This ability is now be, uh, starting to, 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 to being lost. Why? Because students now are needs to, to be constantly uh, st uh, stimulated. When you give lectures uh, nowadays, everybody has a computer, 
You think they take notes? Not really. They, they play on games, they are uh, chatting on, uh, on, on social media. And so the brain has to be constantly stimulated. And it's completely changed the way uh, mm -hmm. uh, people think. And we have to question um, the, the effect, the long-term effect of that it's kind a, of... It's a kind of physical addiction as well, isn't it? It is. It, is, it is playing on the dopamine. Addiction. Exactly. Every red light you get is like, ooh, you know, and you, you, that's, that's sort of... They've done mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, uh, intentionally. Um, and, and I suppose what John Marcus is saying is talking about the whole problem of acting listening, how difficult it is to, to really, you know, just sit and... Finally, we had, um, uh, you know, fittingly, we, we opened the festival with a, a, a listening session for Stevie Wonders in the Key of Life. So we had the, the, the double album and we all sat in the Garrison Library and, and it was a very interesting um, exercise because to actually just sit and not look at your phone and not, uh, you know, uh, and then you could just sort of see everyone just slowly relax and kind of really get into the music and you started hearing harmonics and overtones and, and it was just a fantastic thing to do but it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's the sort of the thing you find in meditation, Jane, you know, that, that to... to um, well, I know, th yeah, I mean, that's it, certainly from, from, I mean, and, and uh, you know, I should be clear that we're not, you know, with Peace Being, we're not attempting to teach people meditation no. because um, that's a, that's a, a long practice and requires attention. Um, so we're working within the creative constraints of, of, of exactly what John Mark is describing. And, and so our testing was that if, if you say to people, it's seven minutes, they won't click on it. Uh, six minutes, they won't click on it. Five minutes, you will get a percentage of people who will click on it. Um, it's better if it's one, right? Um, so you know, and my view is that, you know, and, 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 and what Jean-Marc and, and all of us are talking about is, is, is the current state that we find. Um, but we have to, rather than setting ourselves in opposition to that, we have to work with those creative constraints. We have to, you know, you have to meet people where they are, really, in order to try and, and activate some other part of their humanity, right? Because, you know, all of this mechanistic thinking and the computer age and technology, we're all very focused on the mind. Um, and my interest is in activating the, you know, the, the other systems, those kind of, uh, you know, the seat of our creativity, which I believe is in the heart. John Mark and I may not agree about that, but that's the, that, that, that is how I, how, how I see it. And I think that that is our, you know, we forget about the, you know, how powerfully creative we are, because as Alfred was saying, the, the world as we see it is a reflection of our collective belief. And, 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 and look at it, right? That's extraordinary. That's mirroring us. Yeah. That's extraordinary what, what we have created, the good and the bad, however you want to label that. So, um, so it's a, I think we have to meet people where they currently are, having been manipulated by... And, you know, let's call a spade a spade. I mean, this is, this is private sector. It is un unregulated greed, right, which has allowed this kind of hacking into people's minds, opening up the trap doors. Um, and we all like to think that we're not manipulable. You know, we are. You know, hence my, you know, my kind of shock at my naivety in the, in the aftermath of, of Brexit. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that I had missed the fact that all of these things, you know, are still alive in, in, in the world. So, and I think that, that is, that's something else that needs to be addressed, uh, is, is, is why we don't collectively feel that the technologists, and the engineers, um, don't have some kind of overarching responsibility. You know, we, we expect yeah. doctors to, to take a Hippocratic Oath that they will do no harm, and yet, you know, the power that technologists have and engineers have, and, and, it's, uh, and there's no accountability, there's no responsibility put on them and how it's, how it's used, so. Yeah. Whoever wants to jump it's in. It's no accident. <laughs> it's no accident that the most powerful form of manipulation is asking questions mm. and, and drawing information out of people mm. because when you are articulating, answering questions, you feel like you're in control. And actually what you're doing, as, as Jean-Marc was talking about, is you're giving away some, mm. uh, some really important information which then can be used to manipulate you and the articulation I was giving about active listening earlier can of course be used in all sorts of malign ways as well as benign you know you can think I, I, I can sit here and think well the way I'm going to change your view is I'm going to draw out your opinion I'm going to understand your perspective and then <clears throat> I'll have that much more capability to to nudge and move you in the direction that I know is right. And 
we, th we can go about it that way, but actually our, I, I believe fundamentally in the end there'll be unintended consequences coming out of that. Mm -hmm. I feel from my experience over the years where I began my career with a very clear political objective, you know, I was, gr I was a Green Party politician, I, I got elected by surprise. I then became co-leader co of the council, even more surprised. Mm -hmm. But throughout that process, I was really clear about what I wanted. I was part of a process that created a manifesto of the truth mm -hmm. and I was going to rally uh, all the support behind my opinion because my opinion was the right one and it had all the, all the uh, evidence behind it and I'd meet my opposition on the battleground of the election and I, I was surprised, I won, uh, but not overarchingly and, and actually and the more I did that, the more I came to realize that I was being, um, I was being pulled into a system mm -hmm. and changed myself. And so instead, what I decided was the way politics is operated normally uh, and the, the, that I was part of didn't work to shift people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. And what I have come to realize is that actually rather than, me, rather than uh, articulating my idea as the truth and bringing people alongside, we need to change the whole paradigm, the way things are done. And politics is broken. Uh, and if, if, uh, if I can articulate this as clearly as I can, it's quite difficult, I've shifted from thinking about that my mission is to change people's opinions on nuclear weapons towards my perspective. It's moved towards I need to change the way this debate and this discussion is, 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 is done. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where we're going to end up with that. And that's okay. Because in the end, it's the way we go about these, these decisions. It's the way we integrate technology. Uh, it's the way we have these discussions and the way we can be ambitious about our ideas that is more important even than the ideas themselves mm -hmm. or the or where we're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. Alfred? I mean we're talking about yeah. the going back to grassroots and community and you know, but what, yeah. what do you have to say about what Paul said? Well um, I had, um, in the time when I was working at Google, I had, uh, I had interesting discussions about um, the position of these global technology companies. And uh, what I found is that um, a lot of these folks, and uh, John Mark, we spoke uh, briefly about that over breakfast, um, they think, you know, uh, the political systems uh, which we are facing right now are broken. So, um, and in consequence, they feel, you know, we don't have to pay taxes to a broken democratic system um, and uh, not breaking any laws. You know, they, they make clear we are not breaking any laws. We're using the loopholes. And that is we, we need to do that um, to, uh, because our shareholders are expecting that. that. That is the excuse, I think, they are using. But um, so they say, okay, you know, we... We don't, we don't need to support um, broken democratic systems. Um, and instead, we can make better decisions. And so what this leads to is, um, is a world domination. What this leads to is we are better to making decisions for the world than elected governments. What this means is that you know, these people completely seeing that from the commercial perspective. And I had the session, I said, look guys, I have a totally different opinion on this because I don't want to be governed by somebody who has a commercial intention. And that's what it leads to, mm -hmm. the intention and the attitude. From which point are you doing something? Are you doing something if to, to uh, make money or um, profit maximization? Or are you doing something because you said, I want to contribute in a broader sense to our society? If I do that, there are different priorities mm -hmm. which will come out of this. And, uh, and you can break this down, not to reduce it just on meditation. Meditation is a nice tool for awareness setting. But I think what we do, and this is what I'm doing if I'm going into companies and saying, okay, how is your bonus and incentive system structured? How do you recruit people? On which premises? What are your intention and, and your attitude when you, when, you, when you bring people in and when you lay people off? 
How do you do this? What is your product? What is your product about? Is that an artificial desire which you created or is that something which is really needed for our societies? If not, why do you do this? Do something else. Try to find out what is your position. Why are you really uh, a company, an organization which creates value and not just justifying your own position based on something you create artificially? That are the questions we have to ask ourselves. And that is very concrete. Mm. It's not like, you know, going somewhere yeah. on an island and doing something. Mm. You know, I know that there is a company in the valley in California who are creating artificial islands because there are two kind of spaces in the universe mm -hmm. where there is no legislation. <laughs> one is space and one is international water. So the international water, you know, these guys will create um, artificial islands and it was usually the idea, um, it came up because they said, oh, there are so many rich people who might not be willing to pay taxes, so why not let them create their own system by, you know, creating an artificial island, putting it somewhere in the international water, and they can create the same thing. Technology companies nowadays said, oh, this is a wonderful idea, because if we want to, why manipulating people? Why not creating a singularity where, you, where we're putting chips in the brain of people and then creating this so-called transhumanism. What you just mentioned is enhancing people. I would say it's reducing people because what they do is they're cutting you off from your connection of your heart and your soul. And that is the, the foundation of creativity. So what they want to do is creating these islands and prove that this transhumanist society would be a perfect kind of model for the world. And I think, you know, it's not about like what you said, Paul, it's not about right or wrong. This is about understanding what is happening and understanding what we need to do, not to fight against this, but to fight for something else. If we fight for something else and coming together, creating communities and bringing people on different levels, I call that acupuncture points of our societies and of the world. So politicians, societies, organizations, companies, individuals, education system, bringing these people together and saying, okay, let's see how, how are we, you know, what do we really want? In which world do we really want to live? And then creating models, companies, organizations, societies, which we really want to live in. That is the ultimate goal. And that is what we need to do. And not, you know, making here incremental changes and there incremental mm -hmm, changes. Mm -hmm. That won't work anymore. John Mark, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, how uh, doable is it? How, how, how realistic is Alfred? Well, I think that the, the issue that is being raised there is very important. Is we have to think about the power of uh, these companies. Uh, if you think that Apple might become the first trillion dollar nice. company, yeah. Um, think that Facebook has about 2.3 billion users. Instagram just reached 1 billion users. So uh, if Facebook would be, would be a country, it would al almost be twice the size of uh, China. Uh, think about these numbers. And think about, uh, we're not talking uh, about an oil company. We're talking about companies that are developing devices that are directly interacting with us. So here you have a huge problem of governance. Because when Facebook suddenly decides to do an experiment where uh, for a while they just uh, uh, um, provide good news to a certain group and negative news to another group, and they look at the differences of the how uh, the user's behavior change. Um, if you are doing that kind of research at university, you have to go through ethical protocols, you know, and it's very much regulated. When these companies are doing this kind of experiment, you know, who has oversight of it, or, or, over this thing? So we really have to question, uh, it's, a glo it's, a, it's a more global question about distribution of power. And if you think about where the main players in the field right now, you have five companies in the US, three in China, and that's about it. 
Europe is not on the map, India is not on the map, we're not talking about Africa. Uh, so here we have, uh, there are lots of questions in terms of the geopolitics of um, this, uh, this emerging tech. And you have two different models. You have the American model, which is driven by the private sector. So you have a few companies, privately owned, that are uh, conducting business and state is actually not trying to interfere with it. And we see the, the consequences with the Cambridge Analytica scandals. Now Europe is taking a position on that, on data, because the Europeans have a much more conservative approach to uh, data privacy than uh, the Americans. And then you have the Chinese model. The Chinese model is private companies that are basically uh, supported by state, Beidou, Alibaba, or Tencent, they are basically, uh, they have to obey uh, what the government is, uh, is, 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 is willing to do. And they capitalize in China on the domestic market because 1.3 billion users provides a lot of data. But what we, are see, what we see now is that they have developed a model that they're starting to export. And we're discussing at breakfast uh, this idea of a social score system. In China in 2005, they introduced a system where uh, individuals are being assigned a social score originally based on the kind of uh, behavior you had on the internet, what kind of products you, you were buying. Then they uh, took a few cities, uh, made some tests, and the first of May of, of this year, they expanded that to the entire country. Meaning now that last year, for instance, you had 20 million Chinese who were trying to book train tickets or fly tickets online, and when they were uh, uh, when they were about to click on buy, uh, they got a message that they could not uh, buy this ticket because the social score was uh, too low. The social score originally was about your transactions on internet. With improvement of technology, it has gone beyond that. Now you have CCTVs uh, pretty much everywhere in China. Your behavior outside is being monitored. So if you jaywalk, uh, face recognition algorithm will recognize you and then assign you a bad score. But it's not only that. It's not only your own behavior. It's the behavior, it's the behavior of your friends. So your social network will impact on your social score. So basically the Chinese have managed to create the perfect uh, uh, system of uh, surveillance. They have managed to gamify obedience. And the Chinese now are starting to export this system. Zimbabwe uh, has, uh, is, uh, is currently uh, uh, dealing with China, but other uh, uh, states in, in Asia. So the point I'm making here is that uh, we have tremendous technological developments that, for, that are empowering authoritarian states, and uh, these states are using that to increase the control of the population. And in the West, we have this philosophy of free market where you have individual companies that are basically calling the shots. Uh, when a company like Google wants to have a specific regulation, you know, they have means to convince governments to, 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 to abide by them. So in terms of international governance, there are a big question mark about how, who are these people accountable to? And we have, we, we might talk later about the philosophy behind that. As we mentioned before, uh, this is transhumanism for some of them, for the key player in that, and transhumanism is the idea of killing death, is mm. the idea of being immortal. Mm. The problem is that would be a nice idea if anyone would have access to this technology. Mm. But uh, those who will be able to, uh, to have access to the technology, if it ever happens, will be only a selected few. Yeah. So basically, we probably have the seeds of the next authoritarian uh, ideology here. So again, we have to be very careful about, again, the social history of technology. You know. Absolutely fascinating. Thanks, John. I think what we need... Well, I'd love to talk about how Gibraltar fits into all this, mm -hmm. but after, <laughs> a, after a break, why don't we just take a 10-minute break? Is that OK? And then these guys have got so many answers to questions, and we'll take some, some questions after. So why don't we just have a 10-minute break now, and, and uh, we'll see you in 10 minutes, as I can. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>